ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم لا سهل الا ما جعلته سهلا وانت تجعل الحزن اذا شئت سهلا اللهم انا نسالك الاخلاص في العمل وان ترضى عنا وان تغفر لنا زلاتنا واخطائنا انت الكريم والقادر على ذلك we are beginning our foundations of islam class which will inshallah be running for 5 weeks uh, this is a class by allah's permission that alhamdulillah I've uh, taught several times uh, here at the masjid. Uh, it was designed not as a new Muslim course per se, but really to help any Muslim to learn some of those basic elements that every Muslim should know. A lot of times when someone comes into the religion or when someone's new to the religion, then the focus is when you I'll talk about Islam is the five pillars of Islam. And when a person sees himself implementing the five pillars of Islam, then he considers himself implementing Islam. And that's that's correct. Those five pillars are the basis of Islam. But a part of that journey is not being sufficed by action alone. It's important that this journey in Islam is a constant process of learning. A person has to take care to learn just as they can take care to do and what happens sometimes is when a person separates learning from doing they begin to feel empty inside if a person is not nurturing his heart if a person is not nurturing his heart with beneficial knowledge then it's very easy to have been praying for the last 10 years and fasting for the last 10 years and giving zakat for the last 10 years and having performed hajj and still feeling empty inside. Allah gives a wonderful example in the Quran of iman. He describes iman as a tree. A tree. A kayf alam tara kayf darab Allah mathalan kalimatan tayyiba ka shajaratin tayyiba. Do you not see the example that Allah gives? The example of a good word which is la ilaha illallah is like a good tree. La ilaha illallah. Not, I didn't describe it that way. Allah described it as a what? As a tree. When you say la ilaha illallah, a seed of iman has been placed in your heart. That seed, in order to grow, has to be watered regularly. And the growth is going to be what? It's going to grow overnight? It's going to be what? Slow. It's going to be slow. There's going to be days you're going to be trying and striving. You're not going to see anything. But that tree is growing. And if Allah blesses you to stay consistent, then eventually you're going to see a little bud. And then after a while, you begin to see a stem. And then that stem over time will grow into a trunk. Then you'll begin to see leaves and then you'll see fruit. But that tree has to be nurtured. If a person is doing but they're not nurturing their heart. What do you mean nurture my heart? When you come into Islam, do you know everything you need to know about Allah? No. When you come into Islam, do you know everything you need to know about worship? No. When you come into Islam, do you know everything you need to know about iman? No. When you come into Islam, do you know every way the shaitan is going to try to trip, trip you up? No. So if you never learn those things, then you're going to remain in the same place that you were when you first came in. But if along with increasing in actions, you're increasing in knowledge as well, and it's a slow process. You learn this bit today, and this bit tomorrow, you've got this one, and you're reminded about it in this. After a while, you've accumulated something by which your heart can be nurtured. And so the point of this course is to help to establish what are those basic concepts that I need to be familiar with. 
What are those things that I need to have a good understanding of so that I can continue to develop my understanding of those concepts? This course is originally an eight-week course. Alhamdulillah, when the, uh, the flyer was set up, I saw it was five weeks. <laughs> I, said, I said, subhanAllah, but it's good. Alhamdulillah, because it's going to begin right, right at the beginning of Ramadan. And Ramadan is special. It's a time we should be able to you know, seclude ourselves to the worship of Allah as much as we're able to. But hopefully, and in the month of Ramadan is a month where people begin to read the Quran again. again. What I hope happens here is that after five weeks, that reading of the Quran is much more enjoyable because you begin to see a lot of those elements that we were talking about in your reading of the Quran. It's not just reading for recitation, but it's reading for contemplation, reading for understanding, and that that Quran becomes a source by which our hearts are nurtured. nurtured. That, is my, that is my hope, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives success. So the course objectives, what are our objectives for this, these five weeks? Number one, we want to talk about the foundational elements of Islam. What are basic concepts that as Muslims, we should know and then we should work to grow. We're going to be looking at those concepts, inshallah. Number two, a part of my goal here is to help you develop a relationship with the Quran and Sunnah. We cannot read the Quran once a year. It has to be a daily interaction. At least we're listening to it and contemplating its meanings, at the very least. I mean, maybe you're busy, you know, maybe you have a lot of things to do, you're always running around, okay. Get yourself one of those, if you, if you understand Arabic, play the Quran. If you don't understand Arabic, play the one with the English translation and think about what's being said. And Allah sent down this Quran, not just because it sounds nice. He sent it down as guidance. And so in order for us to be guided, we have to pay attention. It's a roadmap. But in order to benefit from a roadmap, you have to read it and look at it. And you got to see which roads are going where so you know which way to go. It's not simply because you have a map in your car that you're going to automatically be guided to places. You have to what? Read the map. You have to sketch out where you're going to go. It's the same thing here. Just because you got a Quran on your shelf or, or, or on your dashboard or in your glove compartment doesn't mean you're going to be guided. Just because it's on your nightstand, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help you unless you open it up. And so that's the idea. I want us to have a relationship with the Quran and with the Sunnah. And what I, what I hope to incorporate in these lessons is that we actually go back to the Quran and actually read some of the text together and just see how Allah talks about things. Even with the English translation, you get something. It's not the same as the Arabic. You know, I encourage you, if you have the ability, try to learn Arabic. Try to learn Arabic. I didn't know it at one point in my life. And Allah, Allah made it easy. Allah simplified it. It's been a journey, and I'm still learning. But it's a process. But Allah will give tawfiq to those who, who, who really want it. By his permission and by his goodness, we ask him to make us thankful. The, th the third thing we want to emphasize in this course, which we talked about a little bit earlier, is to emphasize the importance of lifelong learning in Islam. That you never stop learning. Just like you never stop worshiping. Is there a day we're not going to pray five prayers? I hope not. Well, there also shouldn't be a day that we stop learning. I mean, from the du'as that the Prophet would say in the morning was what? Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'ah. Allah, I ask you for beneficial knowledge. That's the way we start our day, asking Allah for beneficial knowledge. Allah, help me to learn more. Not just to do, because worship is not just doing. Worship is not just doing, and that's sometimes where our definitions of worship get muddled. Worship is not just actions you do. Worship is also what you know, because what you know is going to save you from disobeying Allah. Sometimes it's not that you're asked to do something. Sometimes it's that you're supposed to not do something. Well, what's going to stop you? The fact that you know that Allah is watching you. The fact that you know that there is a day of judgment. The fact that you know that this sin is going to have an effect on my heart. And it's going to make it difficult for me to do other acts of worship. You didn't do anything there. And not with any physical action. It was knowledge that Allah blessed you to have that did what? It affected your heart. And so it's important that we nurture that heart. Knowledge is action. 
Knowledge is worship just like actions are worship as well. We have to understand that. That's an important principle in Islam. That you know and do. Allah says in the Quran, فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ Know لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ You got to know that. You don't just say it. You got to know what it means. And know what's required of you in order to fulfill that, that wonderful word by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save, save us by his permission. This is the outline. I'm always ambitious with my outlines. We only got five weeks, so we got we to get this done, all right? So what, what you'll notice, inshallah, is that each week we have three things that we're going to be looking at. In the first hour, inshallah, we're going to be looking at the merits of Islam. What do we mean by merits of Islam? The mahasin of Islam, the things that make Islam different from any other religion. You got to know that. You got to know why you're a Muslim and why being anything else isn't going to help you. Being Buddhist is not going to help you. Being Christian is not going to help you. Being a Jew is not going to help you. Why a Muslim? Why isn't everybody saved if they just believed in God? We're going to be looking at those things. What does Islam offer that no one else offers? That's the merits of Islam. The next part we're going to look at are the remembrance phrases. A lot of our worship involves saying certain phrases on our tongues, like subhanallah, like alhamdulillah, like la ilaha illallah, allahu akbar, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. What do these things mean? What am I supposed to be thinking about what is supposed to be coming to my mind when I say these phrases? That's important. You say them in the prayer. You say them after the prayer. You say them in the morning. You say them in the evening. It's important for a Muslim to know what these phrases mean. We're going to be looking at that. That's going to be in part of the second half. The last part, we're going to be looking at Surah Al-Fatiha. Because Surah Al-Fatiha is recited every single rak'ah of prayer. Every Muslim memorizes Surah Al-Fatiha. Allah does not require you to do something a lot unless it's important. You pray five times a day, not just because Allah wants to give you busy work, because it's important. And he makes us recite Surah Al-Fatiha in every single rakah. Why is that important? We got to know that. These are fundamentals, and that's what we're going to be focus on, focusing on, inshallah, in this short course, inshallah. So the first thing that we want to look at is are the merits of Islam, and the merit of Islam that we're going to be looking at this week and next week is Tawheed. We're going to be looking at Tawheed for two weeks. Why two weeks? Number one, because there are some foundations we have to set in order to understand why Tawheed is so important. The establishment of Tawheed, that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the exclusion of everything else, that we worship Allah and that we worship Allah alone and what that means, that distinguishes us from everybody else. All other religions, they claim to worship God. They claim to worship one God, but there's a deficiency in how they worship him. The perfect worship of Allah is found in Islam, in the Tawheed. And we're going to look at that and break that down. The other reason is because I needed to take some time at the beginning of the class to, to give an introduction. And so because of that, I knew I wouldn't be able to cover everything I wanted to uh, in, in one lesson. So we're going to be looking at it over two weeks. So the first thing that I wanted us to, to bring to mind is Allah doesn't just want your actions. Allah does not just want you to do stuff. That's important. Sometimes we feel like worship is just doing stuff. I did, I did, I did what I was supposed to do. Allah doesn't just want you to do stuff. Allah wants your heart. He wants your heart to be dedicated to him. Because guess what? If your heart is dedicated to him, then you're going to do the actions anyway. If you're committed to Allah, if your heart is committed to Allah, you're going to do what he says to do. If your heart is not committed to Allah, you might be doing what he says today. But you might not keep doing it. If your heart is not fully invested in Allah, you might be doing acts of worship today, but you might not continue. Whenever something else more important to your heart gets involved, then you run the risk of what? Of stopping what Allah tells you to do. And so Allah doesn't just want your actions. Allah wants your heart. Allah mentions in 
sorry, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith of a Nu'man ibn Bashir, hadith number six in the 40 hadith of Imam al-Nawawi. The 40 hadith of Imam al-Nawawi, that's a book everybody should have at home. 40 hadith. It's 42 hadith, very short, very concise, but these are principles of the religion. If there's no other hadith that you memorize in your lifetime, that you read over and over again, the 40 hadith are important. Hadith number six. At the end of the hadith, he says, in the body is a morsel of flesh. In the filjasidi mudra. Ida salahat salah al kullu. In the body is a morsel of flesh. If this morsel of flesh, is this, if this little bitty organ, if it's okay, if it's sound, if it's intact, if it's healthy, the rest of the body is going to be healthy. You don't have to work to worship. It, you're already going to do it if your heart, if this little piece of flesh is, is okay, then everything else in the body is going to be okay. But if it gets corrupted, if it gets corrupted, then the rest of the body is going to get corrupted in as much as this morsel of flesh gets corrupted. What does that mean? That means a Muslim has to give attention to what? His heart. It's not just about what you do. If this little organ, this little piece of flesh, if it gets corrupted, that corruption is going to spread to the rest of the body. You've got to control this organ. This little bitty organ is what affects everything else. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah wahil qalb. That little piece of flesh, that little organ is the heart. The heart controls everything else. And so Allah wants your heart. And anybody who really understands human beings, and there are people who study human beings. There are psychologists who study human beings. There are business people who study human beings. They know this reality too. They know that your heart controls you. And so anybody who knows what's valuable, if they want you, they don't need to put you in chains to have you. What do they need? They need your heart. If they can put your hopes and your fears and your desire in them or in what they have, they have you. That's why on YouTube, you can have a what? A five second commercial. Five seconds? Five seconds. Just five seconds. Oh, I just need you to look at this thing for five seconds. Why? Because if you see it for five seconds, what's going to happen? Your heart's going to get attached to it. And once your heart is attached to it, then you're going to do what you need to do to get it. People study human beings. What motivates you? Where's motivation? In your heart. What pushes you to do things? Once they have your heart, once they, can, once they can get your hopes and your dreams, they got you. And so what I want you to see there is that every day, every day is a battle for your heart. Every day is a battle for your heart. Every day, a part of what you're striving to do as a Muslim is what? Keep your heart for Allah. That's the struggle. If your heart is for Allah, then what? All your actions are going to be for Allah too. But if that heart is in between, then your action is going to be in between. Allah mentions in several places in the Quran, in Surah Tihud, in Surah Muhammad, and Surah Tinisa, those verses are mentioned there on the slide, Surah Tihud, he mentions the danger of your heart being inclined towards disbelief. For your heart loving disbelief. Allah says in Surah Tihud, وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا don't be inclined towards those who oppress because the fire is going to touch you. Don't let your heart lean. Be inclined towards. Have love for it. Not, not just love like this is someone special in my life, but the love that pushes you to obey. I have to have this person in my life. I have to have this object. Don't let your heart start to lean towards those who oppress. 
And Allah describes them as those who oppress. Why? To make it very ugly to you to even think about being associated with them. Is oppression a good thing? No. Everybody wants justice. Down with oppression. Allah says, don't let your heart start leaning towards those who oppress. Those who are not practicing Islam, by default, they are what? They're oppressive. How are they oppressive? Because they're not giving Allah his rights. And they're not giving the creation their rights. If you're not practicing Islam, you're not giving Allah his due rights, as we're going to see, inshallah. And you can't be just to people. It's impossible because you don't know what justice is. In Surah Muhammad, we have an even dangerous, an even dangerous ayat here. Allah says, Those who apostatized, those who left their religion after the guidance was clear to them. Why did they leave the religion? Because the shaitan made things beautified for them and told them that they had plenty of time to rectify themselves. Then he says, That's because they said to those who hate what Allah has revealed, we're going to obey you in some things. And their hearts could not let that relationship with the disbelievers go as it relates to obedience. As it relates to family, that's not, Allah doesn't ask you to break family ties. He tells you to encourage, he encourages family ties. That's a part of the rights that are your responsibilities as a Muslim. But when it comes to disobeying Allah, Allah mentions here that they apostatized, they left their religion. Why? Because they said to those who disbelieve, we're going to obey you in some things. Not all the way, but in a few things. But if you give them an inch, what's going to happen? They're going to take a yard. They're going to take a mile. They're going to keep going. It's not going to stop. They're not going to be happy until you fully cross back over to disbelief. No. 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 Allah mentions in Surah Tinisa, Wallahu yuridu an yatubu alaykum, wa yuridu ladhini yattabiyuna shahawat, an tamilu maylan azimah. Allah wants to accept your repentance. Allah wants to forgive you, but those who follow their desires, they want you to bend all the way. They want you to leave everything you're practicing and come back to disbelief. And so again, every day there's a what? There's a struggle for the heart. Every day, a part of your duty as a Muslim is to do what? Protect your heart. Whoever gets your heart, they have your money, they have your time, they have your energy. Whoever owns your heart owns you. How do they own your heart? Your fears, your hopes, your dreams are tied to them. So let's look at mankind and let's see why mankind is a bit so fragile here. So every human being has two needs. Every human being has two needs. The first need is the need to feel fulfilled. The need to feel like your life is worth something. You need to feel like you're not just here. That you're doing something that is productive and positive. And if you don't have that feeling then you have to be distracted enough where you're not thinking about it anymore. If you're awake and you're conscious, you're not going to be happy just sitting and doing nothing every single day. You want to feel like your life had a purpose and was worth something. The only way a person is not going to be like that is if they're so distracted that they don't have time to look at their lives until they get ready to die. And then they look at what did I accomplish in all this time that I had. And so people need to feel fulfilled. And this reality is mentioned in Surah Al-Dhariyat, chapter number 51, 
Verse number 56, Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah says, I created the jinn and human beings for no other purpose than to worship me. Allah is telling you here that he created you for a purpose. Allah created you for a purpose. What is that purpose? To worship him. So in the human being is a sense of a need to fulfill a purpose. What is the purpose that Allah wants him to fulfill? Worshiping him. If he does not fulfill that purpose with worship, he has to fulfill it with something else. Allah created him with a purpose. Human beings are purpose driven. Allah has placed that purpose, that sense of purpose inside of every human being. And that purpose will only be fulfilled with what? Worship of Allah. But if you don't worship Allah, then you're going to do what? You're going to try to fill that purpose with something else. Allah has given human beings another need or created them with another need. The need for provision. You need for your life to be sustained. In order for human beings to live, they need certain things like what? Like food, shelter, water, sleep. And so a part of your sense of being human is that you have a sense of needing to get those things. That's a part of being human. No sane, healthy human being is going to sit at home hungry and not try to do something about it. Why? Because he has inside of him a need to be taken care of. That's a part of being human. If someone stops eating, what do you say about them? They're what? Keep it simple. If someone stops eating, they're what? Sick. Something's wrong with them. That's it. Don't get, don't get deep. <laughs> Keep it simple. If someone stops eating, he has an illness. Why? Because a part of human nature is sustaining life. Allah created us that way. There's a point in time where you're going to drink water. You're supposed to be drinking you know, quite a bit of water. But at some point, when you get to that desperate level, you're going to drink water. It's a part of your nature. And so these two things are a part of being human. The need for fulfillment and the need for provision. Now what I'd like us to do... Uh, Brother Tarek is going to hand out. I'm going to give everyone who's here uh, today a copy of the, uh, the clear Quran. Uh, the translation is okay. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not that bad. It was, it was the easiest Quran or uh, translation of the Quran to get in bulk. So we're going to pass those out and we're going to be referencing this sometimes in the class because, again, I want you to get in the habit of reading the Quran. I want you to get comfortable reading the Quran. Uh, for the sisters, if you look on the bookshelf upstairs... On the very bottom shelf, you should see it's a black, it's a black paperback book. There are about six copies up there, inshallah, that's enough. So you'll see those on the shelf, inshallah, for you to be able to. You take those, you can take those home with you. That's your own copy that you want to bring with you to class uh, every single day. So, subhanAllah, I mean, sometimes, I mean, I mean, nobody speaks like Allah. I mean, just 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 keeping it real, mashallah. Allah, when Allah speaks, it's you know it's Allah speaking. Go to page 144 if you have it. We're on chapter number 16. If you don't have a copy of the clear Quran, just use whatever uh, English translation or Arabic Quran, if you read Arabic, uh, that you have. Uh, we're on page 144 of the clear Quran, the very beginning of Surah An-Nahl. Surah An-Nahl, the chapter of the bee, is known as the chapter of blessings. Allah talks about the blessings that he's given to mankind and he calls mankind throughout the surah, throughout this chapter, to be grateful for those blessings. At the very beginning of the chapter, at the very beginning of Surah An-Nahl, Allah talks about the needs of people. He mentions the day of judgment. And then he begins to talk about the needs of human beings, the primary needs of human beings. Why do you, what's the connection between talking about the day of judgment and then talking about the needs? What's the connection between that? 
Allah is going to talk first about the day of judgment. And then he's going to start listing the needs of human beings. Why? What's the connection between those two? On the day of judgment, you're going to be what? Judged. Questioned about what? About the blessings. The jahim. You will see hell. You will see it with certainty. Then on that day, you're going to be asked about the blessings. You're going to be asked about the comfort and the ease that Allah gave to you. A part of what you're going to be questioned about is the blessings. And so look at the consistency. That surah is all the way in Juz Amma. Surah T what? What, what surah is that? Uh, it's not surah T Zalzala. What's the other surah? Uh, 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 Tekathor. Surah Tekathor. The, the amassing of wealth. Yeah. Here in this surah, Allah mentions the day of judgment. That's when you're going to be what? Asked about what? About the blessings of Allah. And then Allah lists the blessings. Allah says the same thing. But he does it in different ways. And that's a part of why reading the Quran takes reflection. Allah is consistent. Allah is consistent, but you have to pay attention by his permission and ask him for success to recognize the consistency and see how he says the same thing in different ways. He opens up. We're just going to read it in English because for the sake of time. The command of Allah is at hand. فَلَا تَسْتَعْجِلُوا يعني The command of Allah, yani the, the command of everyone to be resurrected. The day of judgment is coming. Don't ask for it. It's on its way. It's coming soon. Subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yushrikun. Exalted is Allah above what they associate with him. And the idea that they think that he can't do it. They make him like everyone else. They believe that he can't resurrect their bones. That's why Allah is saying subhanahu. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Exalted is Allah above what they associate with him. And they make Allah, they treat Allah like everyone else. How is he going to resurrect these bones? The same way he created you. That's how he's going to resurrect him. Don't ask for it to come. It's coming. It's coming quickly. Then he says, he sends down the angels with revelation by his command to whomever he wills. Why does he mention revelation? Because that's the first blessing. The first blessing is the guidance that Allah gave to your heart. That's the first blessing. Before food, before drink, before water. What you need more than anything else is you need what? You need revelation. Because without revelation, your heart is not going to be guided. It can't see. And so he mentions the first need. The first need of human beings is revelation from Allah. He sends down the angels with revelation by his command to whomever he wills of his servants, stating, warn humanity of la ilaha illallah. And so fear me. This is the message. This is the message that the Quran, that the revelation came with. With the messenger. He mentions the, the book. He mentions the messenger. He sends down his revelation by his command to whoever he wills amongst his servants. Any of the prophets and messengers. To warn of la ilaha illallah. Then he says what? He created the heavens and the earth for a purpose. For what purpose? For you to worship him. For you to know him and worship him. Ta'ala amma yushrikun. Yani those who, those who they worship along with Allah don't create anything. Then he says, he created human beings from a sperm drop. Then behold, they openly challenge him. Allahu Akbar. And he created the cattle for you as a source of warmth. You need to be warm. And food. And many other benefits. They are pleasing to you when you bring them home and when you take them out to graze. Not only did Allah give you your needs, but he also gave you things just to make you comfortable. Nice things to look at. Flowers. We know that, you know, bees and, you know, pollination and how we need that. But well, in the springtime, you look and you see the flowers in the trees and it's just nice to look at. The idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not just take care of your physical needs. But that he made the earth beautiful because he had you in mind. He knew that looking at beautiful things would be enjoyable. And so he gave you those things as well. And they carry your loads to distant lands 
which you could not otherwise reach without great hardship. That Allah helps you to be able to travel. Travel is a need for what? Why do you need to travel? Not for vacation, <laughs> R&R, huh? rest and relaxation. Nah, why do you need to travel? To, seek up his to, get, to get money. Yeah. How is money made? Travel, overseas. Most stuff, if not all the stuff that is here that we buy in stores is from where? Overseas. From China. Yeah. yeah, that stuff had to travel. Yeah. That's how people make money. That's how you do business. The big money is made through what? Through doing business. How are you going to carry your goods someplace? Allah made these big animals. That could kill us. What? Subservient. You ride them. You eat them. You put your big loads on them and they just carry them. No problems. They don't buck. They don't fight you. They just carry them. Why? Who are you? Allah did that for you. But we become? We become arrogant. We see it and we act like it's just supposed to happen. No. He also created horses and mules and donkeys for your transportation and adornment. So you, could, so you could ride and so you could look good riding. Allahu Akbar. Not just to ride. So you can ride and look good. Look good, look good while you're riding. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. SubhanAllah, that's what he says, not me. He says what? For you to travel, for your transportation and an adornment. <laughs> not just you ride, but you look good on that animal. <laughs> I mean, if a person begins to read the Quran in this way, how can you not love Allah? Who thought about all of this? You know what I'm saying? Not just gave me what I need, but was concerned with how I felt about it. You know? I mean, a person, you know, does it, wants to get to from point A to point B, but people wash their cars and wax them and shine them. Why? Because I want to look good when I'm rolling. Right? Allah, Allah, <laughs> kept, Allah kept all of that in mind. Allahu Akbar. You know? This is... No. And it says, and he creates what you don't know. Any airplanes and everything else that was to come. We're going to stop there with this. But I, I encourage you, read all the way to line 18. And go to line 17. This is where he finishes talking about the blessings. He says, can the one who creates be equal to those who do not? Will you not then any, use your mind? The one who did all this for you. Are you going to make him equal to the one who can't do any of this at all? Like they can't even do half of it? This is the beauty of the Quran. This is what we need to be reading. Well, like you read this stuff, you, fall, you, 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 you love Allah. Your heart is attached to Allah because you recognize, man, Allah was good to me. He didn't just give me what I needed, but he was concerned with how I felt about it. You know, he could have just sent down one type of fruit to grow up all over the world. And that's it. But you go to a grocery store, you choose lemons and grapefruits and oranges and apples and pears and bananas and strawberries and blackberries and raspberries and blueberries. Did you need all of that? And then they're all different colors. They could all be the same color. It could just taste different. Not only does it taste good, but it looks good. Allah did that for you. He didn't have to do it. Did he have to do that for you to live? He didn't have to do that. These things help us. This is nurturing of our hearts. This is what makes our hearts inclined to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so man has two needs. The need for fulfillment, that he has some sense of purpose. That purpose is supposed to be worshiping Allah. But if it's not worshiping Allah, it's going to be anything else. If a person does not need a sense of purpose, that's because he's distracted. He's being entertained too much. That's why you find people that just be on their phones all day, they don't get nothing accomplished. Because they're distracted. But if they turn that phone off, they can't sit for too long. What, they gonna, what do they say? If they, if, they, if they don't have their phone, if their phone battery dies or it's broken and they're just sitting around the house, what do they say? I'm bored. I need something to do. There's plenty to do. But notice that a person can't just sit all day long. I need, that's a real need. I need something to do. I need something to do. Why do you need something? Because that's what you're created for. That your life has some sense of purpose. The only way a person is not going to have purpose is if he's distracted. If he's distracted. And that's why these devices, a person has to strive to limit unbeneficial interaction with them. Because they keep you from achieving. 
They keep your life from being meaningful. They keep you distracted from a sense of purpose. Just put it down. Put it down for an hour. I need something to do. I got to do something. I, I need to get up and, you know, make some type of sense of my life. That's right. Turn off for a couple of days or, you know, for a couple of hours. Now, and so the human heart, we're going to come back to the heart now, because the heart controls the human being. The human heart is going to be tied, attached to, obedient to, subservient to these two needs and whoever or whatever one believes can fulfill them. Your heart is going to be attached to and is going to be a servant to whoever or whatever you believe fulfills these needs. That's why a person can get up across and drive hours to get to work in the morning, get up at four o'clock, got to get to work. Why? Because work does what for him? Pays the bills. Pays the bills. It takes care of my needs. I may not like the job. It may not be what my ambition in life was to be, but it takes care of my needs. And so, subhanAllah, I can wake up to do that. I'm sleepy. Doesn't matter. I'll leave my need for sleep because I need to get something to eat. A person's heart is going to be attached to whatever takes care of his needs. The need to for, 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 for sustenance, the needs for, for provisions, and the need for fulfillment. Whoever does it. A person who go to school, pay lots of money. Allahu Akbar. Loans, huge loans. $100,000, $200,000, why? I got to get this degree. Because if I get this degree, I can get what? I can get this job and have this career. Maybe the career is really what I want to do. It's what's going to make me feel like my life has a purpose. If, it, if it's not for that reason, it's so I can have what? Money and take care of all my needs. If I get this degree, I'm going to be set. I'll be able to get whatever job I want. So I'm willing to pay huge amounts of money. Did I have to force you to pay that money? No. You willingly gave it over. Why? Because your heart was attached to that degree. And what your mind imagined, it could do for you. How do you know that degree is going to do that? How do you know that that career is not going to be obsolete by the time you graduate? You don't know. You know you're going to live that long. <laughs> Subhanallah. Thank you, Brother Abdullah. How do you know you're going to live that long? Allahu Akbar. Now, how do you know? You don't know. But that dream you pictured in your mind about how comfortable or happy you're going to be, it's enough to motivate you to spend your money, to get up early, to do things you wouldn't do for anyone or anything else. On the weekend, you don't get up that early. Sleep in. Why not? You, there's plenty to do because it's not attached to your needs as you see them. As you see them. And so your heart is going to be Controlled, controlled by whatever you feel takes care of your needs and gives you a sense of purpose. That's why people max out credit cards. People max out credit cards because they need to buy stuff to feel happy. At least that's what they've been told. They don't feel any sense of purpose and any sense of worth. And so they feel like having things that other people have will make them worthy. And important. And so they rack up huge debt. Why? So I can feel like somebody. And they play with it for a couple of hours and then do what? Put it on the shelf. Forget about it. It's on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Why do they keep buying stuff? These, ain't, these aren't even needs. But I, I need to feel like I'm somebody. I need to feel like I'm important. I, like, I need to feel like my life has value. And so I put valuable things around myself. Because when I look at him, I can say, hey, I'm important. I got one of these things. Your heart is going to be controlled by whatever you think takes care of your needs. And so the struggle is to strive for a tawheed. What is a tawheed? That you recognize that Allah, Allah is the only one who takes care of your needs. Yes, I go out to work but Allah feeds me. Yes, I'm going to go get an education and get a degree. I'm going to have a career. But Allah is the one 
Allah is the one who I strive for. And I'm hoping to be able to do something for Islam, to worship Allah in the work that I do. And whatever money I get from this job, I know that Allah is the one who blessed me to get this money. He blessed me to get the job. He blessed me to complete the schooling. He blessed me with the money to pay for it. Blessing after blessing after blessing. He blessed me with the mind, able to do this type of work. Not everybody can go to college. And not everybody needs to go to college. Not everybody needs to go. Why does everyone feel a sense of a need to go? Because that's what society has told them is what? Gives them value. If you don't go to college, you're nobody. It's not true. Somebody without college. If college is for you, if, if your career needs college, go to college. But don't go to college trying to prove something to yourself. You see people with bumper stickers on, they, on the back of their car. I went to this school. University of such and such. Who cares? I mean, really. Like, why you got to tell me that? It gives them a sense of value. Really, it does. The sweatshirt, the pants, the sweats, the bumper sticker, it makes them feel like their life has a value. They're trying to look for a sense of purpose in something else. The struggle is trying to find purpose in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that is our ultimate purpose. And recognizing that he is the one who fulfills our needs. And that's what we were created for. And that's the only thing that's going to really make us feel happy. That's the only thing that's going to make us feel really happy. Why? Because that's the only thing that's truly stable. You can get your dream job, but then you get sick. You got to give it up. Or the company goes out of business and they got to let you go. Or it doesn't fulfill your financial needs. Then what? Now you're back to square one again. I don't have a purpose anymore. I had my job. It was a great job. It was what I always wanted to do, but I lost it. And you find that when people get there, and this shows you why fulfillment is important. When people don't feel fulfilled, when life begins to crash down on people, what they set for themselves up to be their sense of purpose, when they don't get it, when they're denied it, what happens? People get suicidal. They get suicidal. Life is not worth living. Why not? You got food. You got water. Yeah, but I don't have purpose. And it's not just a job. It might be people. Person's in love. This person's my life. They leave me. Life is not worth living. Really? <laughs> That's serious? Allahu Akbar. That's how it is for some people. As human beings, this is what I want us to put in our minds. We have to have a sense of purpose. Why? Because that's how Allah created us. He created us with this sense of purpose. We have to do something. What did he create us to do? To worship him. If you're not worshiping him, you're going to need to put that, that desire in something else. You're going to need to put that desire in something else. Or you're going to need to be distracted from that desire so you don't think about it. And so, Tawheed is to worship Allah alone. That you give your heart over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And giving your heart to Allah, it involves certain rights. Recognizing that Allah has certain rights. And so what I want us to get for here is the rights of Allah are not just things you do. They're also things you know. We worship Allah by knowing and by doing. Tawheed, when we say is the worship of Allah alone. When we say worship, we don't just mean doing stuff. We also mean that your mind has to accept certain realities. And accepting those realities is first before the actions. That's why there might be people who are sinful, who break Allah's laws, but they'll still eventually go to Jannah. How? Because in their heart, that knowledge of those realities is, is there. They're short in fulfilling. They fall short in fulfilling the requirements of those realities. But the knowledge of it is in their hearts. I know I'm not supposed to be doing this. I know Allah has forbidden this. I know I need to get my life together. I know he deserves better than this. That knowledge will save you, inshallah. That knowledge that this is Allah's right and I'm going against it and I should be doing better. That remorse that comes with disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, that, that by Allah's permission will save a person. 
Now, and so the first right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to be acknowledged as the sole possessor, distributor, and source of all goodness, perfection, and beauty. Anything that's good, anything that's wonderful, anything that's beautiful, any positive quality, any wonderful human being, any great job or career or action is the creation of Allah. Everything wonderful about you and me that makes us feel special and poke our chests out, all that we have and all that we are of smarts, of beauty, of intelligence, of strength, all of that is a gift from Allah. You did not give it to yourself. All good, all goodness from any way, shape, or fashion. We have to recognize that. There is no good that comes from anything or anyone else except that Allah is the one who put it there. That's his right. That you recognize that. And if you recognize that it's Allah that gave it and not that creature or being itself, then it's very difficult for your heart to be attached to that thing. It's only when we begin to see power, independent power, independent goodness, independent strength, independent beauty in something created that our hearts become attached to it. But if you know that Allah is the one that gave whatever they have what they have, then you're going to be attached to Allah. Number two, the exclusive right to all acts of ritual worship indicating that one is a deity. Anything that is considered worship to a God, any act of worship can only be done for Allah alone. Your heart has to acknowledge that, that only Allah deserves anything considered worship. Dua, religious travel, prayer, whatever in your mind you consider to be worship, the heart has to recognize that that is only for Allah and no one else. These two things have to be known. Not recognizing either of these two will take you out of Islam. Number three, Allah has the right to be loved revered, and obeyed more than anyone or anything else. This is Allah's right, that you love him, that you respect him, and that you obey him more than anyone or anything else. If there's a conflict, he has the right. And this is where we might fall short. And it's not okay to fall short here. And this is where a person is under the will of Allah. If he wants, he'll forgive him and let him go if he makes a mistake here. And if he wants, he'll punish him. But the person who establishes the first two and falls short in the implementation, he's in danger, but he still has hope. And number four, he has the right to be the only one directly depended upon and turned to for what we need. That doesn't mean we don't ask other people. Doesn't mean we don't work for other people. Doesn't mean if you get a flat tire, you don't ask anybody for help. I depend on the law. No. You ask for help, but you recognize whatever help comes to you has come from a law. And if one person shuts his door, a law can open up 20 more. That your heart is tied to a law. You might ask other people because you have to. You go to the, the hospital. That's asking someone. To find some treatment for the disease that I have. But I know that the cure is coming from Allah. My heart is not tied to the medicine. I'm taking it. But my heart is not tied to it. That's the idea. The last thing before we uh, break for prayer. The human struggle. This is what we struggle with every single day. To learn to depend completely on Allah to the exclusion of everything else, even ourselves. 
that we learn to depend on Allah and not depend on anything else, not even ourselves. That we feel weak and broken and unable unless Allah helps us. Number two, to fight our inclinations and those of society in order to be completely obedient to Allah. Society's going to call us. It's going to tell us that we need other things to be happy. The human struggle, part of that struggle is to ignore those calls, to fight what we might feel as a struggle inside, to continue to do what Allah tells us to do. Why? Because we recognize that our happiness, our fulfillment is through him and that our needs are taken care of by him. Acknowledging Allah as the only creator and manager of everything and acknowledging his right to all forms of worship and obedience is the first step in this journey. At first, you have to what? Acknowledge. You have to know in your heart that these are the rights of Allah. Allah deserves this. If at least I can get there, the implementation is possible. All right. So what we've covered so far and we said next week, inshallah, we're going to look at we're going to look at the remainder of this topic. First point, every human being is controlled by his heart. It is what Allah wants from us, our hearts and what everyone else wants. Your heart is valuable. Every single morning, every single day, the struggle is to protect your heart. For, and preserve it for Allah alone and make sure that no one else takes hold of it. Number two, the human heart is tied to two primary needs that a human being has. The first is a need for fulfillment, to have a purpose, to be working towards something meaningful because that's what makes people happy. The other need is the need for provision. You need to be taken care of. You need to eat. You need to sleep. You need money to be able to live. The need for fulfillment is greater because we said that even if people have the material needs, food and water, if they don't feel like their life is purposeful, then they, run the, they, they might take their lives. They need to feel like their life has meaning. And so fulfillment, having something that we're working towards, that we're striving for, is what defines our purpose. Tawheed. The worship of Allah is the purpose for which we were created for. And it involves, number one, recognizing Allah's exclusive rights, that he is the only fulfiller of both needs, that only through worshiping Allah will we be happy, and only by depending on him will our needs really be fulfilled. And based upon that, we submit to him. We do everything he tells us to do because we recognize that he is the only fulfiller of our needs. If you recognize that only Allah takes care of your needs, then you'll worship him. If your heart is attached to anything else for those needs, then you're going to be obedient to that thing or that person in as much as you feel like it fulfills your needs. The struggle of life is to implement this reality. This is what we're working for. Every single day, we're trying to keep this in our minds and to work towards this purpose. SubhanAllah, this is, makes a difference between a person who just prays every day because I, I'm supposed to and between a person who prays because he's asking Allah for help to stay on track, to not be distracted, to not be misguided. He recognizes that his heart is precious and that the entire world is buying for it. And he doesn't have the ability to protect it without Allah's help. We ask Allah SWT to guide us to beneficial knowledge and righteous actions and forgive us our sins and our shortcomings. Subhanahu wa bihamdik. Shalom la ilaha illa anta astaghfirullah.